Good morning to everyone and hello if you're watching on playback on record. My name's Catherine Townsend and I'm Head of Customer Accessibility at Barclays Bank in the UK. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing this morning's panel session on financial inclusion and accessibility in banking. And then we've got a fantastic panel um, from all over the world. Uh, I've got two people with me in the room. I've got Jake Abma from ING Bank and Thomas Jelinek from Cash Reader. Um, and virtually I should be joined by uh, Oksana Trishankova from Russia and Monica Ackerman from Canada. Um, there they are. Hi, good morning, ladies. Great to see you. Um, Hi. So, hello. <laughs> Um, we are, I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction about some of the things we're doing in the UK and at Barclays and then we'll be hearing from the panellists and I might have a, a question or two for, for my panel. Um, so um, just to really kick off, uh, set, to set the scene a little bit about this session, um, I've been uh, proud to be working at Barclays on this agenda for the last 10 years and I think one of the things that I've seen um, most is the need to focus on high tech and low tech at the same time and I'd just like to sort of as for us to consider that as we go through today's panel and we hear the balance of physical cash needs as well as digital tech and accessibility of the web and mobile platforms and about that balance in ensuring that we consider the needs of all users those who are digitally enabled and and those who are are reliant on more low-tech solutions. Um, I'm really fortunate as well that one of my other hats that I wear, um, as of last year, I was appointed by the, the Cabinet Office in the UK to be the UK Government's Disability and Access Amb Ambassador for the banking sector. Um, this is something, it's a model that's been running for a number of years in the UK. The UK government appoints 17 different sector champions, so people who have a business role or experience in disability and accessibility. And their task is to use the, their experience and their network to further the agenda for disabled people <coughs> um, as it relates to their sector. So as I said, I'm covering um, and leading for the banking sector. There's also sectors like tourism, education, housing um, and ins insurance. Um, we also come together to collectively tackle issues that cross cut across, um, across those different industries. Um, so I've been in that role for, for six months and it's a three year role. And I'm really pleased that one of the things that we want to tackle in that space is looking at what we can do at an industry level to really turn the dial on, on things that have been previously perhaps left at the bottom of the pile. And what can we do to really um, advance um, advanced services for those who might still be left behind at the moment. Um, but just to jump back to some of the things I've seen in, the Barclay, in my time at Barclays that relate to um, the panel topic today. Um, so, as I said, whilst we've got a digital first strategy, it's really important to make sure that those digital platforms are accessible. Some of the other things that we have to balance along with that remain quite low tech and, and tactical and tangible and, and physical. Um, throughout the time I've been at Barclays, we've been at the forefront of leading accessibility services and we were the first bank in the UK to deliver talking ATMs for vision impaired people. Um, we were fortunate enough to uh, win a Zero Project Award for that um, and also our sign video service which enables digital access to sign language interpretation for, uh, for, deaf, for deaf users. Um, we've also developed things like accessible payment cards, so your debit and credit cards with a physical notch or high contrast colours to enable you to use the card more independently and accessibly. Um, we've also developed low-tech solutions like coloured overlays to help people who use print communications but need a different colour to do that, or um, check templates to place over the, the checks with braille, um, braille markings to help you complete the check independently. And it's, and it's the, the balance of those things that helps, obviously, when you're an organisation like Barclays with so many million customers with diverse needs, some who are very advanced uh, technologically and those who are um, reliant on more physical methods. One of the areas of focus at the moment is around um, embedding inclusive practices across the organisation. Um, it makes me really proud when people don't have to come to the accessibility team to, to help solve for what they're doing. We're trying to embed a culture of thinking about um, inclusive practices, universal design from the outset, and we're actually rolling out now a template and a training tool to help colleagues who are developing products and services 
think about the needs of all customers and make sure that they're not causing any harm or detriment um, in, in, in what they're developing, such as financial exclusion and um, inaccessibility. Um, on the financial exclusion point, I'd just like to bring that back to the um, topic of the, the ambassador focus. Financial exclusion um, is slightly different to accessibility, but absolutely related. This is where a consumer group might be excluded from entering banking completely. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about tackling in my time as an ambassador is um, to promote and improve access for um, consumers who have cognitive dif difference or learning disability. And I think while we've seen quite strong advocacy for people with sensory and mobility difficulties, we've seen less um, advocacy for those user groups with learning disability. And I'd really like to push, um, push that agenda um, and, and, and ensure we can have those customers get independent access to banking um, and also ensure that their families and support structures such as carers who are an intrinsic network in that in that mix also to get the right support because we see across the industry that this is an area that's not yet been tackled um, and I'd really like to focus on. So enough about uh, the UK and my activity I'm going to come on to my panel we're going to start with Oksana um, Trichenkova as I said who's um, streaming from Russia so um, Oksana if I could head over to you and uh, please give us your presentation you've got eight minutes. Well, okay, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I know that the project uh, conference is broadcasted all over the world, so some of you watch the session late at night. Anyway, I'm sending all of you warm greetings. It's a big honor to be invited to speak at the conference. I'll talk about that um, topic as accessibility implementation at VTB Bank. First, just a couple of words about myself. I am one of the accessibility team staff. I was fortunate to get this position um, a year and a half ago. And I'll tell about my team a bit later. Uh, VTB is the second largest bank in Russia operating all over the country. And the first stage of the accessibility implementation was ATM's adaptation for blind and low vision clients. And that started two years ago. ATMs were equipped with voice assistance for blind and low vision uh, clients have the option to activate special software to make an inversion. So a user will see dark font and a white background. In September 2020, we started working on digital services accessibility. Uh, VTV Online has been redesigned and we started from a clean slate. Uh, it's important to notice that we didn't do any special website or mobile apps for persons with disabilities. We take the inclusive approach in our work. Uh, we conducted a big research to find out what challenges persons with dis different disabilities face using banking services. We gathered focus groups and led individual UX interviews with blind and low vision persons and also with those who had hard of hearing problems and intellectual disabilities. So we're, uh, this is what Catherine was talking about. Uh, we concluded that we should adapt internet banking and mobile banking for uh, screen reader users first. Otherwise, they won't be able to log in and make a frequency payment. Uh, the starting point was gathering with designers, developers, testers, and negotiating about terms we use to identify elements and their place on the web page or on the phone screen. Uh, we used the innovative approach to work on this task. Uh, for instance, my immediate manager brought the tactile tablet used by orientation and mobility instructors so we could place figures and touch the scheme designed. Uh, all the information uh, was uh, learned by my peers and actually the process uh, occurred, you know, uh, the progress occurred in our work. Uh, the process includes uh, testing of services, analyzing results, uh, search for optimal solutions and spreading this process uh, to all teams at the digital business department. A couple of words about the accessibility team. Uh, there are three experts, including me. Uh, we are all totally blind, advanced uh, ass assistive technology users having experience in accessibility field. 
Also, the team includes analysis, designers, uh, internet and mobile app developers, testers, and it's led by the product owner. The team is responsible for UI kits accessibility. We created the guidelines for each product team role, explaining how to build, check, and support accessibility. These guidelines are mandatory to read for all, all product teams. Now we introduce constant regress testing model for all functions. Besides, there is a rule that none of the functions could be released if it is not adapted to accessibility demands. We attract visually impaired uh, customers to try VTV services. Uh, updates are posted on VTV social media. Also, we were invited to participate in a special program about financial literacy uh, broadcasted at a radio station for the blind. Beside that, we uh, recorded podcast series and shared it on different platforms. We put a banner on internet banking main page asking users to tell us about their special needs or share the information about accessibility services VTB provides. Uh, we can see that the amount of visually impaired clients is increasing. Besides, uh, we are invited to speak at different uh, conferences for IT specialists as well as for non-IT uh, audience. Uh, the biggest achievement for us is the second place in annual accessibility rating for internet banking and mobile services submitted by Usability Lab for 2021. VTB was one of 21 participants. The most frequent operations have been tested. 90 evaluation criteria have been chosen. In comparison, VTB took the eighth place in 2020 rating. Although a lot, have been a lot have been done, it's a long way to go. We will uh, be continuing to improve a regress testing process and also create new functions such as personalizing, personalizing offers for PWDA, make services more accessible for other categories of people with disabilities, and establish a helping hand service for protecting elderly customers and customers with disabilities from scammers. We believe accessibility isn't one time promotion. This is a permanent process and it requires a complex approach and a teamwork. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Oksana. You've clearly been really busy. A round of applause. Absolutely. Uh, You've been very busy in your one and a half years at, uh, at VTB. Just a couple of things there that struck me. Um, one of the things, great to hear that you're thinking about the, the breadth of, of accessibility and financial inclusion. You mentioned financial literacy. So it's actually, you know, you might have access, but actually then thinking about somebody's capability to do banking is also really important. And the protection of the elderly and, and everybody from the, you know, the terrible um, fraud and scams that are occurring. Um, and that's currently an issue that's obviously been exacerbated since the pandemic. Um, thank you, Oksana. We, we might come back to you for a question if we've, if we've got chance uh, and time at the end. Um, Thomas Jelinek um, from Cash Reader, can I go over to you? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm Tomas, and uh, I'm here uh, from a startup uh, company, and we are making uh, mobile applications uh, for the visually impaired. I would like to talk a little bit about the newest uh, application which we have called Cash Reader, and it is uh, an application for the identification of money. Uh, please don't mind that a couple of slides uh, from now will be uh, mainly for the sighted people, uh, just for them to understand the problem which we are trying to solve. Uh, so just try to imagine if you are blind, how would you work with money? How would you be receiving it, giving the money? How you know what you have in your pocket, what you have in your hand? It's a uh, a problem which a uh, visually impaired uh, person is dealing with almost everywhere in the world. In many countries, 
they are using just a plastic template and they rely on the length of the banknote. So they basically fold the banknote around this plastic template in order to um, actually feel some uh, braille um, uh, characters on this plastic template to understand if it's uh, 5 euro, 10 euro, 20 euro and so on uh, yeah, everywhere. You can uh, imagine that in some countries it's n even a bit harder because the banknote has the same length. So they cannot use even this plastic template. So for example, in US, they have these uh, carry-on devices. Yeah? So basically, they scan the banknote in order to hear the, the denomination of the, of the US dollar. Uh, and we were thinking that both of these solutions are um, not that easy easy to use, so we created uh, a mobile application. Basically, you just install uh, cache litter and the uh, only thing that you need to do is to point uh, your phone's camera to the banknote and the application will immediately recognize what currency you have in hand and also what's the, what's the value of the banknote. Uh, good thing is that we have more than 100 currencies so uh, visual impact people can use it on a daily basis at, uh, at their home country, but also when they travel abroad, they can rely on it because they already know how the, uh, how the app works. And uh, basically it doesn't matter if they point to the euro or if they point to some Uganda shilling or they travel to Asia, so, so they have Thai bacht in their uh, hands and so on. So they can just use it everywhere. Uh, what we do, we are always trying to think how we can help uh, more people with our app. Uh, so uh, we were also thinking how to make it accessible to the deaf-blind uh, person. And uh, we came up with a solution of uh, having a vibration patterns in the application. You can imagine it in a way that if you point to the 5 euro banknote, it will vibrate once. If you point to the 10, it will vibrate twice, and et cetera, et cetera. It works the same for every currency. It's also nice for, as, a, as a privacy feature, so your phone doesn't speak aloud every time where you are handling with, with, the, with the cash, with the money. Uh, we are uh, happy uh, that our user base is growing and in past uh, three years uh, from, from the start of Cash Reader, uh, we are reaching almost a half million uh, users downloading our app and uh, we also received uh, some awards uh, like the one from Microsoft or Vodafone Foundation and we are happy to add to this uh, slide also uh, a new award from the, from the Zero Project Conference. So we are really proud on this one. Uh, just about, uh, uh, you, can, you can download the application for your iOS or Android device. It's uh, free to download. You can use it for, for two weeks and enjoy all the functionalities, try it out. So just, just do it, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it will help you. And after two weeks, uh, it will be limited uh, to just smaller uh, denominations like 5, 10 euro, and if you want to recognize uh, higher denominations, uh, you can purchase our full version. Uh, we are also cooperating with third party companies uh, and we are offering our te uh, money reading technology to their devices. So for example, we are cooperating with uh, Envision. They have smart glasses, uh, so you don't need to always use your phone, but if you are used to some other device such as smart glasses or some specialized uh, phones for visually impaired, uh, you might find a cache reader on these devices as well. And it works the same. Just uh, <coughs> look at the banknote or point at the banknote and you will uh, get this uh, feedback uh, um, spoken up. Uh, this is our team. We are just a small startup from Czech Republic. So basically, if you write us uh, on social media or email us, uh, you will get uh, to me, to my, to my colleague Martin or my colleague Alex. Yeah. So, uh, it's, uh, but we are also working with many organizations uh, around the world, especially with uh, 
uh, visually impaired uh, users who really like our application and they became our ambassadors in their countries. So uh, they help us to translate the application to their language. So right now uh, we have more than 30 languages. So I'm pretty sure that if you use our app, it will be talking in your language, which makes it much easier for the voiceover. Um, so it will be working just fine for you. If you want to help us in a, in a way that, for example, your currency is not uh, in the cash reader, you can always write us. Um, here on, uh, I'm presenting a map uh, where every green field is a country uh, where the cash reader is already able to identify local currency. We are, I think that maybe <laughs> like 80% of countries are covered. Uh, of course, our goal is to uh, cover every country in the world and you can actually help us with that. Uh, because in order to add a new currency to the cash reader, we always need to have uh, physical banknotes. So people from all around the world, <coughs> they are actually collecting banknotes and sending them uh, <coughs> to us uh, to Czech Republic. Yeah? And then uh, we are uh, processing the banknotes and uh, within like two or three weeks, uh, we have a new currency in the, in the app. So, Many thanks. Uh, you can always meet us on social media. Uh, I encourage you to, to download the application, try it for yourself. I hope that it will be helpful. Don't hesitate to reach to us. And I will be also happy to answer any question later on. Thank you, Thomas, and congratulations on your Zero Project Award. Um, Thank you. Do, uh, do you send the cash notes back to the people who posted them into you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that would be too difficult and also expensive because most of the time uh, purchasing the banknotes is very cheap, uh, uh, but actually the delivery of the banknotes is very expensive. So we always pay to people who collect uh, the banknotes for us. So we pay every cost, shipping and everything, and then we keep them. So I have a very nice album of banknotes at my home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. And, and it's interesting, you were talking there about the, the security, you know, without um, it reading aloud the bank note, it can just, you know, do the vibration. That's something that's actually really important and reminded me of a comment I had from a customer um, who was also, um, she was vision impaired, and she talked about how contactless payment methods for her were fantastic because she described the sense of fear, being at the um, paying for something, getting her wallet out, um, and using cash, and not knowing who was watching her, um, not knowing, you know, um, feeling feeling threatened, but actually having something invisible like a, a an Apple Watch mm -hmm. or another mm -hmm. contactless payment method um, for her really gave her a better feeling of security, and I think that's the theme. Uh, that cuts across different things from your solution to, to things like Apple Pay. Yeah, according to our statistics in the application, uh, most people are actually using vibrations. Yeah, because it's so comfortable to just feel, uh, I don't know, you, you feel two taps in your hand and you immediately know that it's 10 euro. Yeah, so it's mu much easier than hearing it aloud. Maybe you are in, in some environment that, where it's not so easy to catch what the application tells you. So I, I think that this is a very uh, mm. <laughs> good feature in the app. But it also reminds me of the, the, the importance of using disabled user, user testing and how important that is because you can make assumptions about why something's useful or easy. Oh, you think, you know, using your Apple Pay or your whatever technology is for ease, but actually it was listening to that customer who told me about the sense of security and fear that she has that, that just shows it's really important to make sure in the development of any of your products or services, mainstream or accessible, that, um, that you're engaging disabled users uh, testers in that process. Okay, uh, well, Jake, um, we're going to come over to you next. Um, so, Jake Abma is from the Netherlands and ING Bank. Please, over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jake Abma. I'm from the ING Bank in the Netherlands. Let us go to the slides. ING attributes great importance to being inclusive and to the accessibility of its services. In recent years, ING has carried out a variety of activities to increase its approach. So let us look at some of those activities and related processes. We are currently placing more emphasis on digital services like mobile banking with the app and internet banking with my ING. We aim to be the mobile-led bank of the continent. 
An example is the creation of 40 instruction videos on web-based and native app banking with closed captions to be found via the website and on the ING YouTube channel. Furthermore, we offer Start With Online Banking PDFs, helping step-by-step -step with how to use all functionalities customers can print them out and grab when desired. And also a dedicated accessibility page guides people with different functional needs in their search for help. So many customers use the internet or mobile banking app, but there's also a group that still needs a helping hand. In addition to being welcome at ING branches and shop in shop service points for questions about daily banking, we also offer walk-in consultation hours where DigiCoaches help with all questions on digital banking, from logging in, installing the mobile app, to confirming orders. We also offer contact options like direct calling from within your app, while still preserving our traditional customer service telephone line, a special balance line and chat. At the same time, ING offers Digi workshops in which customers receive information about safe, secure and accessible digital banking, possibly together with other banks. This also happens outside of ING branches, such as at service points in libraries and by giving lectures at elderly associations. ING also offers online platforms, online support for platforms to learn the basics using digital products. Mobile confirmation with the app is the standard, but not everyone can enjoy this way. Some don't have a smartphone or tablet or have functional needs preventing them from being able to use the app. For different reasons, we also offer the ING scanner. That is a personal tool. But some still people, uh, but still some people might be left out as a disability presents them, prevents them from using the scanner. We offer services for their needs too, like SMS. We are always in search of gaps by looking at the intersection between functional needs and user needs to come up with new requirements. Luckily, lots of those innovative solutions have become mainstream already, like using NFC, fingerprint and facial recognition. Based on a variety of services, products are developed with accessibility in mind, like banking cards with a notch, just as we heard from the Barclays Bank, a gripper to easily get your card out of the ATMs, the possibility to plug in a headphone jack in the ATM, and real banking statements for everyone who needs them. So we create amazing products and services for our users, but how do we ensure that all users are included? Which challenges does an organization encounter bridging gaps of truly inclusive and accessible products? Seemingly simple, there are standards for accessibility and an obligation to meet them. How complicated can that be? So although at first sight accessibility seems simple, that turns out to be simplistic. In reality, accessibility is hard, very hard. There are a lot of challenges with accessibility conformance. Fortunately, we can conclude that there's a lot possible to make services accessible. Everyone within an organization has the great task of contributing to inclusive services and no one accepted needs to be educated on the subject. To serve 7 billion people in an only expanding technical landscape demands changing your processes, enrich and possibly adjust your culture. Becoming truly inclusive and accessible as an organization requires a solid strategic approach. It is insufficient to make individual products in an organizational silo accessible. It is of critical importance to establish repeatable internal processes and methods for ensuring accessibility in the long and the short term. Accessibility is a program, it is not a project. Using a maturity modeling based approach helps assist ING to achieve and retain accessibility compliance and communicate accessibility efforts internally as well as externally. As a way to kickstart your accessibility development, ING has released an open source library called LionWeb. It's a component library where accessibility is implicitly secured. Since the beginning of 2021, together with the Dutch Payments Organization, 
where collective tasks in the payment system come together, I have started and chair a dedicated working group for accessibility and inclusivity. The working group collaborates and connects platforms for members to discuss operational, tactical and practical topics. All the big banks are represented with the mission to embed and cultivate inclusivity and accessibility into our systems. We do not compete on accessibility, we work together. As a result of our initiative, I can happily announce that we have a national action plan accessible payment and as we speak, an interbank local, local initiative. The plan has three components. Number one, ensure that existing individual banking initiatives are better known. Number two, deploy solutions and improvement actions with regard to communication, personal attention at local level and cooperation with interest groups. And number three, identify needs and come up with solutions where vulnerable groups are not yet addressed. This is an example of the strength of cooperation between welfare organizations and the banks. There will be a lot of work to do and the challenge will be very high, but the reward will be even higher. Thank you. Thank you. And I've just realized we didn't give a round of applause to Thomas, so we should just do one for Cash Reader as well. Um, thank you, Jake. Gosh, there's a lot happening. How big is your team at ING? Uh, well, our team is less big than we had before because we are working on the champions model and we have more than 150 accessibility champions on different levels. We have three different levels. And so there are certain people from within our team who found their way within the company and they are our ambassadors at other departments or at other places. So at this moment, we work with three in our accessibility team. Wow, well, huge scale of activity and great that it's multifaceted. I've got caught everything from looking at instructions for customers on how to access things. You know, you've got manuals, but you've also got video instructions. You've got champions programs. You've got embedding in your tech capability and structure. There's, there's so many different things to, to tackle when you're, you're truly trying to embed this. And that's certainly what I've seen as well in, in my time at, at Barclays. Um, the maturity model, do you want to just explain it a little bit more? Was that something you developed um, internally at ING? I know there are some industry maturity models as well. Or what's yes, we, 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 well, basically we use our own maturity model. Um, of course, there are different maturity models out there worldwide. Um, we try to figure out how to mold in a maturity model specifically for our need because every organization, of course, has its own culture and its own processes. Mm -hmm. Um, but also together with a group from within the W3C, we try to work on a uh, generic maturity model. So we try to figure out, do some experiments and blend that within our own processes. Yeah. And if anybody wants to um, know more about maturity model, I think the Business Disability Forum um, have created one through their tech task yes. force, which um, would be available to, to people who want to find out more if you don't have the capability or knowledge to, to develop your own. Um, thank you, Jake. We'll come back to you hopefully for a question because I think we're making really good time. So well thank done, you. and thank you to. Oh, I, oh, I didn't think I got my microphone on then. Um, we're ma yeah, we're making great, very good time. So thank you to my panel for being timely. Um, Monica Ackerman from Scotiabank in Canada. Are you still there? I'm still here. Hello. And, and what time is it, Monica? Where you are? 3.30 a.m., oh, so well, I'm off to bed right after this. <laughs> we really thank you for staying up or getting up early, whichever it is. So thank you so much. It will come over to you for your presentation, please. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm super excited to be at Zero. I, I love this conference, and uh, I'm already learning a lot and seeing that there's a lot of um, can, uh, a lot of shared work that we're all all trying to move forward at the same time. So uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I lead the Scotiabank's Enterprise Accessibility Program. Our team of uh, very talented accessibility specialists are in the design and product community of practice at Scotia Digital. Scotiabank also has digital operations in Mexico, Peru, Chile, and Colombia. And our strategy is to build inclusivity into our banking products and services from the outset, ensuring that everything that we do in this digital world and beyond is accessible by design. We believe that people with disabilities deserve financial products and services designed for them so they can bank with dignity and respect and be active participants in our economy. 
Our goal at Scotia Digital is to create a culture of embedded inclusivity where everyone understands their role in creating accessible digital products. And I'll share just a few of the practices that are helping to build this culture. Next slide, please. When we first started the accessibility program, we started with testing. We bought the tools, we wrote the test cases, tried to convince people to use them, and it didn't work. Too many errors, too much rework, too much cost, led to really low adoption and slow progress. And we knew we had to shift. We had to shift left and start at the beginning, but how? And it wasn't until our team joined the newly formed digital design practice that we really started to make traction. It brought us right to the beginning of the process and much closer to the customer, to the people that use our products. And with leadership support and the creativity and human centricity of our designers, we've been able to shift our culture and integrate accessibility into existing processes and practices so that it's consistent, repeatable, easily discoverable and roles-based. So we defined our standards. Uh, we have adopted WCAG. We plan to make accessibility part of the definition of done. We integrate accessibility into all of our design practices, where, whether it's service design, visual or UX design, or user research. We annotate our designs and communicate the accessibility criteria, uh, which helps developers build to ensure that markup and code meets the standards. And then, of course, we test both manual and automated test strategies. Next slide, please. One of the most powerful tools for scaling accessibility is a design system. As uh, Jake mentioned, and our design system, Canvas, has accessibility engineered into its core. On this slide, I'm showing an example of a four-digit PIN input component. Accessibility is part of the brand, the visual design, the code, and it's tested with assistive technology. So as Jake mentioned, accessibility can be hard. WCAG can be complex. There's often multiple WCAG success criteria that apply to a single component and interaction. Some organizations create their own standards to make WCAG simpler to implement. Our approach is to, to simplifying and standardizing has been to create acceptance criteria for each component. And these criteria pack, capture both the design and development requirements, as well as the, as the expected behavior of assistive technology, so that there's consistency of scope as a story moves through the various stages of development. This robust documentation we made available in both English and Spanish for our partners in uh, South America, our Spanish speaking smart partners. So with Canvas, teams can trust that they're using accessible building blocks to create a much more consistent user experience. Next slide, please. So in order to incorporate accessibility into your work first, you need to know what to do. At Scotia Digital, each new person that joins the organization attends an accessibility session during onboarding. And this intro is followed up with multiple learning options. Alley Boost is a series of roles-based instructor-led sessions for product owners, designers, content creators, QA, developers. Teams can also train together. And what this means is that each member of the team then understands what their domain-specific accountabilities are and how they're dependent upon each other to produce accessible digital products. For those who prefer to deepen their knowledge and learn independently, our accessibility portal includes a roles-based ba curated self-learning opportunities. And finally, as Jake mentioned, uh, you know, we, we know that there's a really high demand for accessibility professionals and uh, low availability. And in order to scale, we have to build capacity in our own organizations. A couple of ways that we're starting to do that is through a train the trainer and ambassador program and also, also regular community of practice meetings. Last year, the team trained over 1,300 people across five business lines, three countries, and in two languages. Uh, next slide. We need to include the voice of the customer and encode, encode accessibility into all we do. Our approach to ensuring that the lived experience of disability is evolving and is shaped around a bit of an iterative feedback loop. So before we build, we do research. The user experience and beta product community teams are deliberate about involving people with disabilities at, at the beginning or before the beginning, actually, to help us understand not only how to build, but what to build while we build. Um, 
Leadership has tasked our digital product teams to plan for and report on how they're incorporating the principles of accessibility, inclusion, and sustainability into their work. The third is being deliberate about asking for, analyzing, and actioning feedback. We do this through our customer advocacy team who compiles feedback from numerous sources, categorizes that feedback along a number of dimensions, including accessibility. The trackers allow us to collect and action data from customers with disabilities and drive systemic change. This year, we're starting work with our data analytics team to create an analytics strategy to gather accessibility insights across uh, the various customer feedback channels, whether it, um, whether it be branch, in-person interaction, telephone, uh, or digital. And lastly, but definitely not least, representation matters. In 2020, our CEO announced the launch of renewed diversity and inclusion goals. And one of those is to increase representation of people with disabilities by 20% in the next five years. Because when our staff represent the communities we serve, we'll build better products, drive innovation, and foster economic resilience and financial inclusion. Next slide, please. So we're also on, on a journey to, uh, as, as Catherine uh, and, and Jake both spoke to, is to address accessibility across all of our policies, practices, services, and facilities. So we started with digital accessibility for customers, expanded to address accessible digital workplaces for our employees, and building in our successes, last year we established an accessibility center of excellence with a mandate to create a cohesive vision and strategy for accessibility across the bank. Five principles guide our work. Nothing about us without us. Listening to the community and co-creating solutions. Accessibility is a human right, needs to be said. Accessible by design. Accessibility can't be thought of, of as an add-on or an afterthought. And really to bring awareness to the fact that accessibility brings value to the bank. When we build experiences for the full range of human diversity, we attract, retain, and delight more customers. And very importantly, recognizing that disability is an individual and lived experience. And we recognize the inherent value of every person and acknowledge intersectional identities. So in closing, the accessible journey is long, sometimes convoluted. It's a path with starts and stops and signposts along the way and things that you've done that, that are kind of cringeworthy that just didn't work. Um, but we keep moving forward and making progress when we work together. There are areas in the bank that have mature practices, others that are just starting, and we still have a lot to do. Um, but we'll keep evolving depending on customer and technology needs. So thank you very much for inviting me today. Thank you, Monica. Um, great to see you again and, um, and see your presentation. Uh, just a couple of points to pick out on there. I, it's the first time we've um, heard value in this presentation and thinking about the, the commercial value of, of disabled people, which isn't something that we should shy away from. It's something I talk about a lot. Many people still don't know uh, the term the purple pound. Um, and in the UK, that's estimated to be worth 265 billion pounds a year. So this is obviously we're all here because we feel that accessibility is the right thing to do, but it's also got a commercial imperative. So when you're thinking about your stakeholders, you know, balancing the heart and mind, that commercial business case is absolutely there. And so great to see you um, cover that, Monica. Um, the other thing, I don't know if you've got anything else to add about the, the commercial uh, factor in Scotiabank. Well, uh, I do. Um, it, it's, you know, that because disability um, uh, impacts everyone, you know, the, we, we, uh, we don't really have great data on, you know, what, uh, what our customers with disabilities, uh, how they bank, you know, um, the, the investments that they have within our company and how, how do we, everybody says, well, how many people are we really serving? You know, what is the value of the work? You know, how are we going to get that return on investment? And uh, part of the challenge is we're not measuring, we're not asking. And so we're unable, if we're not asking, to uh, provide that evidence, you know, as it relates specifically to the bank. And I think that that's something that we really want to tackle this year with our uh, analytics and in talking to our customers. 
Yeah, absolutely. That um, sort of mythical um, business case that so many uh, times comes up in conversation. Um, everyone's like, show me the business case. I know there's some brilliant examples um, of, of, um, of one that came out of the tourism sector. Um, a hotel had made fantastic adjustments as part of a renovation to become accessible. And they could demonstrably see the impact that had on their bo bottom line because they suddenly became a destination choice for um, hosting weddings. There was a disabled uh, a couple who were getting married and they were able to choose that hotel and they were able to see that thanks to the investment in accessibility they were already catering to disability conferences a little bit like uh, here at the Zero Project um, but also things like weddings and, and events so um, I think it'd be great to develop more business cases um, and share those with the community um, so that we've got the financial as well as the emotional angle. One other thing, Monica, I just wanted to pick up on was around collaboration. And obviously, we've met previously virtually. Um, and I think even though we work in a banking environment where you'd think that there's stringent anti-competitive regulation, actually, the regulator's mindset is shifting. And they're actually encouraging, certainly through the UK, encouraging a different approach to collaboration, even with other banks on this topic. And, and I think it's great that, you know, we can, uh, Scotiabank and Barclays and ING and VTB, you know, are sharing best practice uh, to improve things so that we don't have to start from scratch. But I don't know if there's anything, Monica, you want to mention about collaboration? Yeah, um, we have a, a, a group in Canada. We have, uh, you know, five uh, large banks um, and, and a number of other banks and we meet regularly and we talk about accessibility. You know, we t uh, share solutions. We share uh, experiences with vendors that may come to us and say, well, nobody else is asking for this and we know that they, they really are. Um, and in Canada, we recently have the Accessible Canada Act. And um, uh, in that it applies to federally regulated organizations like banking. And we are coming together uh, with our Canadian Banking Association to discuss accessibility um, and with other figure, federally regulated organizations to figure out how do we do this? How do we partner together and really leverage uh, the knowledge that everybody has? Absolutely, and, and the Zero Project tries to foster that collaborative network, um, so it's, it's living proof of us being here today. Um, thank you, Monica. I'm going to open it up. We've not got a huge number of people in the room, and we can't go to virtual questions, but are there any questions or comments from anybody in the room? I'd love to just hear if you've... Yes, we've got... If you could turn your mic on. Um, Thanks a lot. My name is Gabriella Rob. I have a question. So as you are three banks here at the moment, how is it about uh, investing into projects or companies? Are there also um, different uh, objectives uh, when you look at investments into companies or so where you say, okay, we integrate inclusion? So your question is about, do, do we also look at investing in companies who are promoting accessibility? Yes, for example, or gives that an extra point for an investment? I think, I think if an interesting element there, one example I can give is around how we are embedding thinking in the supply chain. So up front in our, in our supply chain, we're now look, asking, you know, are your web platforms, are your digital platforms um, accessible? So by pushing out our expectations to that supply chain, that's going to force it downstream. Um, I'm not aware of um, a big program around investment specifically for startups. That would sit alongside other investments, but I'll open it up to, to ING if you've got anything um, to add. Uh, <clears throat> no, I think we have, we have, uh, we have the same story as, as you have. Uh, we work closely together with, with all kinds of different organizations, welfare organizations, the I Foundation, the Elderly Foundation. So we tightly work closely together. Uh, I'm also not aware of very specific accessibility projects, um, but uh, uh, ING is very socially aware and involved and uh, supports all kinds of innovative projects. So um, if you have a project out there, you might also consider contacting the ING to see if there are possibilities. Fantastic example. And um, I, I don't know if it's possible just to ask Oksana or, or Monica whether you see yeah. um, investment uh, programs in, Scotia, in Canada, Monica? 
Um, Scotia Bank has a program called Scotia Rise, and uh, and it is uh, supporting community investment. It's a five hundred million dollar uh, commitment to in community investment uh, to primarily uh, around building economic resilience and uh, so, and supporting disadvantaged groups. And so there are a number of programs. Um, uh, supporting various diversity groups in, uh, in working in different communities. Thank you. Um, we, we did a similar thing in Barclays during the, the COVID pandemic 2020-2021. The COVID relief fund supported uh, 100 million pounds of giving to um, a variety of organisations tackling things predominantly around COVID, but we made sure that had a disability lens um, to it, absolutely. Um, Oksana, just a chance to um, hear from you if you have anything to add around investments. Well, uh, I haven't heard about such programs so far, and we are at the start of this journey. Uh, anyway, what I can tell you for sure, and that's why I was raising my hand, I just wanted to tell you that we are investing our knowledge because we are uh, just starting to prepare a global meetup for different designers, developers, product owners, so product teams could come from different companies. And we'll be giving them practical cases, practical technologies, no matter if you work at the bank or at any other company. It's going to happen in March. And this is very, very important. It will be broadcasted on YouTube channel. So this is a very, very big event for us, the first one. And also, I want to tell that we are supporting social uh, groups, people with disabilities, such as uh, corporate social respons responsibility, mm, such as um, we support a lot museums for uh, museums for people with disabilities. That's all I know. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Oksana. How can people find out more about the event in March? Well, uh, there'll be um, information from our marketing department, and a marketing department group will be sending announcements. And uh, surely, I could send it. Uh, over to anyone here who is interested. It will be in Russian anyway, but uh, there will be just practical cases. Well, OK, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. We're down to our last three minutes. Are there any other questions in the room that I can? Um, yes, we've got one here. If you could turn your mic on. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so Jonathan Hassel, UK. Um, uh, I was chatting with Jake yesterday and we had a really interesting conversation about how um, those groups of where banks work together um, can actually help every single one of the banks actually move forward because uh, we do a lot of work in competition to try and help organizations see um, how other organizations are investing in accessibility and that encourages them to do that so everybody rises. Um, just interested in how you found using those sort of financial groups to try and actually take the agenda for accessibility forwards. Yep, I'll cover that one if I may, just um, I guess with my hat on as the Disability and Access Ambassador for Banking in the UK. Um, we're working with UK Finance, who is the industry body, um, to create a disability contact group of um, key high street banks and financial service um, organisations to tackle the thematic things that either need a collective response or we can knowledge share between one another. Um, and we found that that works really well on particular to topics um, and more broadly you'll probably hear more particularly in the UK around vulnerability um, there's a big push around customers in vulnerable circumstances now that's not to say that disabled people are vulnerable in the context of banking the bank could create a vulnerability if we fail to make our products and processes and services accessible so we we have that kind of framework of, of vulnerable customer support which is much more broad than disability but to really push this and drive further collaboration so I hope to see more in that space thank you for the question Jonathan. That just gives me a last minute to thank my panel again, Thomas and Jake and Monica and Oksana. Thank you so much for, for um, this fantastic discussion and thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.